we would like for every single photon incident on our solar module to contribute to the generation of free charge carriers. In the previous video, we found, however, that there is a fundamental theoretical limit to the fraction of the available spectrum that a so solar cell can utilize. In this video, we will look into the other optical loss mechanisms that further limit the optical performance of a solar cell. We recall the solar cell design rule figure, which we have seen in the previous video. We now understand that the spectral utilization puts an upper limit on the efficiency of a solar cell. To what extent this limit can be reached depends on the electrical performance, which is the domain of the band gap utilization and the optical performance of the solar cell. Light management is concerned with remedying the optical losses in solar cells. In this video, we will discuss the basic concept of light management. The objectives of this video are to learn about the four optical loss mechanisms in solar cells and the main approaches at mitigating each of the loss mechanisms. These light management approaches involve many of the subjects discussed in this section on the optics in solar cells. We will use the standard crystalline silicon solar cells shown here to demonstrate each of the four main loss mechanisms in solar cells. As we can see in this picture, part of the solar module surface is covered by a metal grid. As this metal grid is not transparent to the incident light, the area under the grid is shaded. These Shading losses decrease the amount of sunlight reaching the absorber layer. To minimize the shading effect, the metal grid requires some clever designing. The solar cell we see here has a classic metal grid pattern on top. We see two conduction paths for the electrons in the middle of the front surface of the solar cell. These paths are called bus bars. The small stripes going from the bus bar to the edges of the solar cell are called fingers. Since the area under the electrodes is shaded, the active area of the solar cell is effectively decreased. The coverage factor, denoted by CF, is a measure of the active area of the solar cell, as it indicates the fraction of the total area of the solar cell that is not covered by electrodes. The coverage factor is therefore equal to the electrode-free area, denoted by AF, divided by the total area of the solar cell. The metal fingers have a certain resistance against electron movement. The larger the resistance in the fingers, the greater the losses will be during charge carrier collections. We would therefore like the resistance to be as small as possible. The resistance R of such a finger is shown here. The resistance can be expressed as a function of the width, W, length, L, and height, H, of the finger and resistivity of the metal, indicated by rho. We can gather from the equation that the resistance can be decreased by increasing the width height product of the fingers. Decreasing the length of the fingers, which means increasing the number of bus bars, will also decrease the resistance of the fingers. Any of these measures will, however, inadvertently decrease the electrode-free surface area of the metallic grid and as such decrease the coverage factor. This trade-off between the resistance of the fingers and the shading of the fingers is shown in this graph, where the power loss of the solar cell is plotted against the finger spacing. We can see several competing effects. With increasing finger spacing, the power losses of the solar cell decrease because of less shading. The power losses increase, on the other hand, due to the increased resistance in the emitter layer and context. Hence, there is an optimal spacing distance at which the power loss is minimal. A similar plot can be made for power loss versus finger width. The larger the width, the larger the shading losses will be, but with increasing width, the resistance decreases. Again, here an optimum exists at which the power losses are minimal. 
We see that optimizing the front contact pattern is a complex interplay between the finger width and spacing. The metal grid is not the only factor that prevents light from entering the solar cell. This picture shows some colorful solar cells. We can observe these colors because the full spectrum of photons is reflected off the solar module surface. The glass plate used to encapsulate the solar modules reflects a fraction of the incident light. Even though silicon oxide is highly transparent to the visible light, it's not completely so. Any light reflected off the solar cell surface will not contribute to charge carrier generation. Introducing an anti-reflection coating minimizes the reflection at the front surface of the solar cell. These pictures show a multicrystalline silicon wafer with and without an anti-reflection coating. The wafer without anti-reflection coating appears silverish, which means that it is highly reflective. A similar wafer with anti-reflection coating has a dark blue appearance. This means the reflected light intensity is much lower. There are different approaches to making an anti-reflection coating. Several concepts will be discussed in the sections on the Fresnel equations, interference in solar cells and light scattering. The third loss mechanism concerns the notion that light is absorbed in all layers of the solar cell. However, only the photovoltaic absorber layers contribute to the actual generation of charge carriers. This means that any light absorbed in photovoltaic in active layers are considered a loss mechanism. This loss mechanism is known as parasitic absorption. Parasitic absorption is of special concern to solar cells with a PIN junction, where only the intrinsic I layer is a photoactive layer. The final loss mechanism concerns the transmission of photons from the solar cell without being absorbed. This generally involves photons with energy equal to or slightly above the band gap energy. These photons have a lower absorption probability. They can therefore travel through the cell without being absorbed due to the limited optical thickness of the solar cell. Several tricks are applied to increase the path length of photons in the absorber layer. Two of these are shown in this figure. The shown cell applies light scattering at the front and a reflective layer at the back of the cell. The scattering of light is applied to deflect light away from the direction perpendicular to the surface, which is the shortest path through the cell. The farther a light beam is deflected from this perpendicular direction, the larger the path length through the absorber layer will be. A reflector at the back of the cell allows the photon to pass through the cell for a second time. The scattering of light and back reflectors are extensively discussed later on in this course. Time for a recap of our optical loss mechanisms. We saw how any solar cell exhibits losses due to shading, reflection of the front surface, parasitic absorption and transmission and we discussed the basic concept involved in remedying these losses. The shading losses should be minimized by cleverly designing the spacing and the width of the fingers. The front reflection should be remedied by an anti-reflection coating, which we will discuss in more details in the following sections. Finally, the light transmission from the solar cell should be mitigated by increasing the path length of light through the solar cell. This will also be discussed thoroughly in the next couple of sections.